Now, you know, in the preparation of, of speaking and preaching, sometimes we come across somebody who's, who's also shared from their heart on the passage. And just so happens that Philip de Corsi on uh, KGBA was uh, preaching from uh, this portion of scripture that we're going to be in today. And he was talking about the, uh, the challenge that Daniel had concerning the, the eating of the, the king's food and drinking of the king's wine as they were entering uh, the training period. And um, he, he commented and he said, Scripture says at the end of the ten days that the, the lads, the four lads, were fatter and brighter than the others. And Philip just shook his head and he goes, I don't know about eating vegetables and making you fatter, but if they were having a little extra bacon and, and beef jerky, maybe then I could t- accept that. But uh, he was just the idea that God can work a miracle. God can change things. And um, today's passage is all about the sovereignty of God. Um, let's begin with a, a, a word of prayer, though, to help refocus us here. Father, we just pray as we open up Daniel and we we preach from your word, Father, that you would open up to us uh, and speak to us through your Holy Spirit. Lord, take the words we've prepared and and send them in our heart. Father, teach us, lead us, and equip us for this week. And we just give thanks for these these things in Christ's name. Amen. So if you would, turn in your Bible to Daniel chapter 1. We're going to pick up there. Uh, A little recap, we started to talk about predictive prophecy, and we talked about how prophecy can at times be apocalyptical, meaning that it's of of the end times, of crisis, of things that are challenging and and, and they're they're, uh, upheaval, in fact, of of nations and events, and uh, sometimes we wonder if we're in that time frame now. Not quite, Daniel's 70th week is yet to be found, but... We are in times where society right now challenges us. It, t- it says that these evil things are right, and the good moral things which we know are good and moral are wrong. And all of a sudden the tide's been turned, and we're, we're the hater. We're the ones that are, are, are prejudiced and bigoted. Well, I let you know that God's standard has not changed, and he is still on the throne. He is still the captain, as that song had talked about. I, I like being having Jesus or God as our captain rather than the, the bumper sticker that said Jesus is my co-pilot. You know, now he is in charge. He's the one leading the way. So the recap we have right now in, in chapter one of Daniel, we have where the king in verse three ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths who uh, was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and had the ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered them to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. So what we have is this hand-selected people of nobility, of part of the lineage of the king's line. And so they brought these young men. And the idea that King Nebuchadnezzar was doing was he had a program that he wanted to indoctrinate nations into his system, his belief, his religion. He captured kings, and he brought them captive to his capital city. He took some of the valuable items of their culture. It's, he, it says in other passages um, that he, he took temple, the gold and precious items from the temple, and he brought them back. So the, you have the temple service, the, the, the cups and the, and the um, plates and the, the, the bowls. They took them back to Babylon. Why? Because not only was it valuable, but he wanted to mix their cultures, bring a little bit back of, of the, the Hebrew nation with him, and in that way, hopefully satisfy those who are captive, that they would blend in. Now, we all know that the Jews have been told not to blend in. They've, they've given, God's been giving them that direction for three millennia, that they do not in, incorporate other gods 
and other traditions into their system. But King Nebuchadnezzar wanted that. He wanted to include them into his system, or at least make them feel included. And then he retrained their young nobles. He handpicked people so that they could stand for him, be a buffer. You know, maybe Daniel and his, his um, friends could actually be the kind of person that the Jews would come to and, and, and dialogue or complain and that they could help settle that because why they've been trained now in the Babylonian traditions and cultures. So Nebuchadnezzar wanted to change their location. He wanted to change their culture. He changed their diet and their identity, even down to their names, all in an effort to make them part of the Babylonian nation. He wanted to succeed. He wanted not just to go for a short period of time, let alone the, the only the seven years that he had in power. So what's in a name? I mean, he gave them new names. We found this out. He says that, uh, <clears throat> let's pick up in verses 6 and 7. Now among them, from the sons of Judah, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned them new names. And Daniel, he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. What's in a name? Well, let me give you a little bit of an insight here. These four names that we just mentioned of Jewish nature all incorporated God in their name. El. El is God. El. Uh, Elohim. Uh, it's, the, it's the first portion of what you, when you understand who God is. So two of the names had El in it. The other, I-A-H, is an abbreviation of Yah. And we understand that to be an abbreviation of Yahweh. So each four of these young men had a name that reflected a character and, and the, the possession of God. Daniel means God my judge. God my judge. And when he changed their names, he gave them the name Belteshazzar, which means Bel's prince, the chief god, deity of, of the Babylonian era of Nebuchadnezzar, Bel's prince. And it means protect the king, Belteshazzar. Hananiah stood for whom God, or who, who Jehovah had favored. Yahweh's been gracious, is what it means. And in doing so, he changes his name to Shadrach. Rak, R-A-K, Rak. Babylonian means the king, and it refers to the sun. The same root as Abrek in Genesis 41-43. And it means inspired or illuminated by the sun god. And another translation, I am fearful of that god. So Shadrach, drawing away from Jehovah, who had been gracious to him, to the sun god. Mishael is the question, who is what God is? Asking the question, who is God? Who is comparable to God? And he changes his name to Meshach. And what it means is, I am despised, humbled before my God. And now the Babylonians retained the first part of his name, there, of Mishael, Meshach. But for the L part, which is God, substituted Shak. And that's the Babylonian goddess called Shishak. And you'll find it in various places in Scripture, notably Jeremiah 51, 41, where there was a, uh, a king with that name honoring the deity Shishak. And... It refers to the, the deity of the earth or possibly Venus, 
the goddess of love and mirth. Now, when you remember in Daniel chapter 5, there's a feast going on. Cyrus is, is actually in charge of the Babylonian Empire and the writing on the wall with the finger. You remember that? And we'll get there. But that was a festival or a, a, a feast for Shishak. And at that time, 539 B.C., Shishak lost. The last name, Azariah, whom Jehovah helps. Azariah, whom Jehovah helps, becomes Abednego, the servant of the shining fire. The Chaldee version translates Lucifer, actually, in Isaiah 14, verse 12. And Nego is the, is the God whom they were consigned for punishment, the three, the three who um, were refusing to bow before the, uh, the, the, the golden idol that Nebuchadnezzar makes in chapter 3. Those youth refuse to bow to that golden idol, and they are consigned what? To the fiery furnace. Now, the youth, uh, and a man by the name of Robert Jameson says, these youth, instead of identifying and relating to Jehovah, these choice servants were being dedicated to the heathen, to a new identity, connecting them to their four leading gods. Bel, being the chief god, the sun god, Rak, Shishak, the earth god, and Nego, the fire god. However, Renaming the youth did not change their character. Renaming the youth only served them to follow through to show that God will prevail. Um, Nebuchadnezzar used that naming, renaming as a triumph, stamp of his authority. You will be known by that. Boom. However, what does verse 8 say? Verse 8, Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine he drank. I believe all the attempts of the Babylonians to change these guys failed. In fact, they failed wonderfully, not miserably. They failed wonderfully. God was still in control. In fact, this whole chapter and the next is all about the sovereignty of God. Daniel is a living example of a passage that we learned about not too long ago in 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 right in that passage where we're talking about it. It says, now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge. So you remember that passage. We were on it for like six weeks, maybe longer. I like it, though, because Daniel decided, he determined, he made up his mind, he set his heart not to be defiled. in spite of where he was at, in spite of the loss of his identity, his people, his home, he set his mind. He, he set it in his heart. He wasn't going to drink, or he was not going to have any pro- prohibited diet items, strong drink. He wasn't going to eat food sacrificed to idols, because that was a direct command in Exodus 34 Verses 14 and 15. Exodus 34, verses 14 and 15. They were getting ready to go into the land. They had been wandering. And now God's speaking through Moses to his nation. He says, 
for you shall not worship any other god. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Otherwise, you might make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they would play the harlot with their gods and sacrifice to their gods. Someone might invite you to eat of his sacrifice. It made a difference. I know in the New Testament, when we get into 2 Corinthians, uh, I believe 2 Corinthians, maybe 1st, chapter 10, it talks about food sacrifice to idols, how it meant nothing to them. God, at this time, was telling his people, who were such in a, a fledgling state, protect yourself, don't eat, don't associate, don't intermarry, maintain your identity. Daniel, knowing this, fixes his mind, and he sought permission in verse 9, not to defile himself, and was granted favor and compassion. I like the way it says this. Daniel was the kind of person who established goodwill around him with those that he was in contact with. It always talks about Daniel uh, obtaining favor and, and, and having strong relationships. Compassion in verse 9, is translated goodwill in the New King James Version. Goodwill. And this is actually another principle that we can find in the New Testament. If you turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, we'll look at it. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. Let me read to you. In the King James, New King James. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart, as to Christ. Not with eye service, as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord, and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord whether he is slave or free. This, to me, is a key passage on how we conduct our affairs, how we work, how we relate to our co-workers, our bosses, those who are underneath us, our students that are around us, our parents, our brothers and sisters. We're obedient, with fear and trembling, with sincerity of heart, not as man-pleasers, but bondservants of Christ. And in doing so, we establish goodwill. And, and goodwill means that people are willing to extend favor. Quite often, goodwill was what they said was the extent of the arm. It's a greeting. And when you extend your arm, does somebody grasp it and shake hands? Or do they stand back and go, sorry, sorry, I don't trust you? Or do you, when, you, when you extend the arm, you offer goodwill. Is it reciprocated? The application here is that character matters. Your character matters. Mine does. Your attitude and your actions will either open doors or hinder your path. Let me say it again. Your attitude, your actions will either open doors or hinder your path. So you get a choice. You get to choose what kind of person you're going to be. Are you doing it for the Lord, whatever your work is? Are you doing it for the Lord? Even if it means to do good to someone who opposes you. That's truly divine. And because of this, the, the request for the, the modified uh, diet of Daniel, and, and I'm not going to get into that. It's been over-preached, I believe. You know, vegetables, the Daniel diet. I'll tell you what, I'm going, yeah, yeah, okay, vegetables and water. But uh, I, I believe that uh, God honored the youths, their resolve, their dedication, and he gave them favor. They gave him wisdom. They gave them success. So that if you look down at the end of this, verse 19, and the king talked with them, and out of them not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, 
and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. To enter into the king's personal service meant that they had face-to-face connection with the king. Others did not have that. Even we know when uh, Esther was was asked by her uncle, her cousin actually, to um, uh, go beseech the king to help repeal this act of killing Jews. In the book of Esther, she says, I don't even have permission to do so. I could step in there and he might on that day, commit me to death. But the king's personal service meant they had access to them. And they were close at hand, so the king could turn and talk to them face to face. I guess I'm going to give you an overview of chapter 2 now. Remember, this is a, a, a portion of scripture where we're talking about prophetic happenings predictions, and results. As you read through Daniel chapters 2, 3, and 4 this week, as you read through chapters 2, 3, and 4, pay attention to what you're reading about God's sovereignty. Because God reveals to Nebuchadnezzar his sovereign plan. So that answers the question. God can speak to unbelievers. God can speak to kings He can change the course of history. In fact, let's not even say it that way. God controls the course of history. To us watching, it looks like a change. But to God performing, it's his perfect will. God has a plan for nations, rising and falling, controlling these events all the way through, including his son Jesus. Nebuchadnezzar Nebuchadnezzar is going to learn in the next few chapters about how God is in control. And it's not him. God is the one who controls events, gives wisdom, changes seasons, sets up kings and deposes them. Instead of going any farther, I'd like to just give a, a brief review and summary. Because when we're teaching a narrative... There's, there's nuggets to pull out. I don't want you to walk away and say, oh, I just heard another story about Daniel. You know, that's not the purpose. The purpose is that we understand the same things that Daniel and his friends held close that changed their life is the same things we hold close and change our life. Daniel determined in his path of life not to be defiled. Can't we also determine not to be defiled? We can, with God's help, make decisions that will change how we act, where we go, how we we interact with people. You determine that. It doesn't happen by accident. It isn't that you can just go, whoops, sorry, I messed that one up. You determined not to be defiled. And Daniel and his three friends, they were successful. They were profitable. And they were worth, uh, worthwhile in serving a, a, a foreign king. They were in a foreign land under poor circumstances. The worst circumstances. Because... To be in captivity meant you were judged by God and being disciplined by God. But that was as a nation. As an individual, they were successful. Can't we also be successful in our job, whether secular or, or of faith? Can't we also be successful with those around us? Building relationships and bridges We don't have to close off. And they did not let others change them. They didn't let anything change them. Even though they're educated for three years, had a name change, a vocation change, these 14 
15, 16 year olds refuse to be changed. Now, if they can have that kind of response and experience those kind of results, can't we overcome everything that society throws at us today? Can't we be more than conquerors? We're not on the wrong side. We do know what the end of the story is, right? Jesus wins. Let's, let's act like that. Let's take that and, and hold our ground and don't let the world try and force you into their mold. We can be unashamedly, in a good way, unashamedly unapologetic for what we believe. Our standard hasn't changed. That's what God is teaching us today. And I, I pray, I pray that when you read this, you, you dare, like the song, dare to be a Daniel, I guess is one, isn't there? Dare to be a Daniel. May we also dare to be a Daniel. Father God, we uh, commit to you the, the words of Scripture, Father, the, the narrative and the dialogue, but Father, also, as we understand the uh, principles and concepts of being determined and faithful, of being the kind of person that, that builds relationships with goodwill. I ask, Father, you would just change us, all of us, for we're not even worthy to stand before you. But we bow before you and we ask for forgiveness. We ask for forgiveness for the, the sin and the, the shortcomings we've had this week, Lord. And we're so grateful that you extend to us forgiveness each time. Father, now call us to higher ground. Teach us, Lord, and we shall be taught. Lead us and we will follow. Where you go, we'll go. Father, we just thank you for these things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please rise for the final song.